So uh, let's get started. I'm Swati and I will be teaching today's class as well as the next class for MA 165 and 265. Today's class is on photolithography and the next class will be on soft lithography and I'll also be talking about the practicums that you guys need to do. Uh, before we begin, did everyone get my email regarding the uh, groups for the practicums? Okay, you did. Uh, I think there are a couple of students who sent me an email. They enrolled like really late. So uh, their names are still not on the roster, but uh, don't worry about that. Before the practicums, I'll send you guys uh, an email, not to the entire class, but just to you, and you'll know which group you're in. Before we have all four practicums, um, the four practicums are on 30th April, May, 1, May 2, 14, and 16. Before all four practicums, you'll have kind of an introduction of what you're going to do in the practicum. I'll be talking about photolithography because uh, I'll be taking your photolithography practicum in, in the clean room also. And then uh, I'll, I'll also talk, I'll give you a brief intro of soft lithography. Then there'll be Ben Dolan from Rapid Tech. He'll be teaching a class. He'll tell you about, about rapid prototyping and uh, what you will be doing there. And you'll actually be making, uh, designing a work piece on SolidWorks and you'll get it fabricated. Uh, and you can actually experience 3D printing. So that will be Ben's class, and there'll be one more class on CNC machining. Most probably uh, also uh, it will be taught by Ben. So there'll be these four classes before the practicums. Today in the photolithography class, however, I'm teaching you also the, uh, the theory part of it, not just the practicum. So let's get started. It won't be a very long class today. Uh, what is photolithography? We all know that, okay, come in. Okay. Come on in and close the door. Yeah. Okay, so when do we start using photolithography and, uh, you know, we do not use other manufacturing, traditional manufacturing tools. You know, we are using light as a tool when we do lithography using, uh, when we call it photolithography. So why, why do we start using light at some point and not use traditional manufacturing tools such as drilling or you know, ultrasonic machining or something, when we go below 100 micron feature sizes. Because that's where it becomes more cost effective, more energy efficient, you can have batch fabrication and you can actually use light as a tool. Also, the materials that we use are not the traditional materials, now we use more polymers and we are doing fabrication mostly on silicon wafers. And now the entire thing changes when we go below 100 micron 100. Of course, it's not, it doesn't have to be 100, exact 100 all the time. It's just a rule of thumb that you use photolithography below 100 micron range. Now, these are the contents of today's class. I'll tell you how photolithography is done, what is the physics behind it, a little bit about the optics that's used uh, in, in machines that are used for photolithography, what kind of materials we use, and so on. Um, Okay, so this is something I already told you. What is micro and nanolithography? This is a more general definition when we say micro nanolithography. Whenever we're making something that's in the micro and nano range using uh, lithographic te techniques, which could also be laser, which could be, you know, things other. So it's a more general definition. Photolithography is when we are more specifically using the UV light to fabricate something. UV light is now our tool. Hmm? And the materials that we use are called photoresists hmm? because they are photosensitive materials. They, uh, they respond to the UV light and the they usually contain something called a photo initiator and that initiator gets activated, um, you know, absorbing or taking the energy from the photon and those are the materials we use. Now, photolithography is called a 2.5D technique, not a 3D technique. Here we need to also understand that men's fabrication comes from, comes from the IC industry. We've taken, you know, that's the inspiration for men's fabrication. The basic techniques on silicon, silicon dioxide, nitride, patterning, etching, all this actually is taken from the IC industry, but now we do men's. What's the difference? The main difference is men's fabrication or micro electromechanical systems, huh? And also now, now they have NEMS, that's nano-electromechanical system. So when we do this fabrication, 
then we actually want to increase the heights of the structure. Because not, now the, the applications are not just limited to electronics applications. Now we also make things like sensors, we want to make filters, we want to make cell separation devices, they have biomedical applications and so on and so forth. So now what we need is structures with, with a certain height. So we need something that's more 3D in nature. However, we call photolithography a 2.5D technique because we don't really have much control over the Z direction. We, we cannot really pattern anything in the Z direction. We can just, however, we can increase the height of our 2D structures, so to say. Okay. So um, these are, this slide tells you about the different techniques that are used in lithography, photolithography, thin films, polishing, etching, diffusion. The main technique here, however, is photolithography. So that's like the center of the wafer fabrication process. A couple of definitions before we start talking about photolithography, a couple of definitions that you need to know is critical dimensions and glass transition temperature. Hmm? Uh, by the way, this slide is there in Dr. Madhu's slides if you, if you uh, downloaded those slides, but it is later. I just kind of rearranged the slides a bit and I added a few sentences here and there. So if you have downloaded those slides, it's fine. The content is, is pretty much the same. I just reorganized it, so you'll be good. I, I'll upload these slides as well anyway. Um, so critical dimensions, what is it? The smallest feature size that you make in your pattern. Something that you're not making, you know, once by fluke. No, you're repeatedly, reproducibly making, you intend to make that structure, whatever is the dimension of your smallest structure uh, on a pattern, is called the critical dimension. Okay, and what's the glass transition temperature? Like I told you just now that we now use polymers rather than other materials for photolithography. Hmm? These photosensitive polymers are called photoresists. Now, polymers have this very special property called glass transition temperature. Any material behaves like a glass, hard and brittle, below this temperature. Hmm? Below this temperature, not above. Above this temperature, it is more tacky. It's more like a liquid. It, it flows. But below the glass transition temperature, the polymer behaves more like a glass. And in photolithography, we, we usually do everything below the glass transition temperature. So when the material is glass-like. We don't go above it because of a couple of reasons. One of them is that it picks up dirt. The, uh, we, we need to be very, very sensitive because we are making something that's micro nano. So if it picks up a few nanoparticles from here and there, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Another thing is that it may spoil your profile. You know, you may, you, your structures may kind of change their shape slightly once they're above the TG. So we want to make sure that we always use uh, a below TG temperature. However, oh, I forgot the laser pointer. However, one important thing here is that the polymers that you use, the photoresist that you use, they tend to change their glass transition temperature during the process. And I'll, I'll get to it and I'll tell you why that happens. We, we use a couple of baking steps, temperature um, related steps, and then what happens, we, we actually go above the glass transition temperature of the polymer, but no, we actually don't, because as we increase the temperature, also the TG goes up a bit. Okay, so we talked about photoresists. Not all photoresists are the same. There are two types of photoresists. One is called positive and the other one is called negative. Hmm? Now, what's the difference? The positive photoresist, all, all polymers have these polymer chains, huh? long chains, molecules are like long chains in polymers. So what happens, these chains get degraded when the polymer is exposed to the UV light. And in case of negative resist, these chains actually cross-link with each other. And they, so, so that portion of the material that actually becomes harder than the rest of the material. Okay, so now because you know that, what you want is you want to make 
a design that looks something like this. Hmm? You see this pink thing is, is basically your photo. This is the pattern you want on your wafer. Hmm? And you are given a positive photoresist. What will you do? You know that the material that is exposed to the UV light gets degraded. Hmm? And that material, now you put it in a solvent, which is specific to that particular polymer, when you put your, your uh, entire design into that developer, then the material that's degraded will get with washed away. You know, it is, it is now soluble in that solvent. And however, this portion that was not degraded will remain there. And so you get this kind of design. Hmm? If you want to make the same thing using a negative photoresist, what, you, what will you do? Now you know that the material that is exposed to the UV light, you see the transparent part here? Whatever is exposed to the UV light is now hardened. It's cross-linked. So that's the portion which will remain there. And the rest of it, the one that's here in the middle, not exposed to the UV light, will now get dissolved, will now get washed away when you dip the entire thing into a developer. Hmm? What is this? This is called a mask. This is nothing but a pattern, a design that you make on a quartz slide. It's, it's usually, don't get confused, people call it glass slide, but it's not really glass because if you know, glass is not, it, it, glass is only partially transparent to UV. And that to UVA, not UVB and C, like the shorter wavelengths. Glass is opaque to shorter UV wavelengths. So we do not use glass here, we use quartz, okay? So on a quartz plate, very flat quartz plate, you print something which can be done using uh, you know, various kinds of printing depending on the feature size you want to make. If you want to make up something that's only down to 10 micron, you can just use rather traditional inks. You know, you can actually get like how you print it on a transparency or something like that. But if you want to go to one micron feature sizes, then you need to use something like electron beam lithography or you need to use a chrome ink rather than just using, uh, you know, a traditional ink. So we, we'll come to that. We'll talk about mass fabrication also. So anyway, this is just the main concept of photolithography that if you have a positive photoresist, you actually make the exact same pattern on your mask that you want on your structures. But if it's a negative photoresist, what you'll make is the opposite of it. Okay. So we know what is mass, what is, uh, you know, what is a positive and negative photoresist. Now, the various steps that are involved in the photolithography process. First of all, you need to prepare the surface. Most of the photolithography, most of the MEMS fabrication is done on silicon vapors. We can also use glass slides, we can use other materials, but mainly silicon is still the dominating material. So how do you prepare the surface so, so that whatever you're doing on it, it sticks to it, the adhesion is good, and uh, you know whatever nature hydrophobic you want it. So that's, that's the first step, surface preparation. Then how do you, uh, how do you apply the photoresist on it? What you do is you basically make a layer of photoresist, a uniform layer. Right now you don't have any pattern on it. So it's a silicon vapor and it's coated with, uh, with a photoresist. And then you will do the exposure. This step is where you'll actually expose it to the UV light. Before that, you'll also get rid of the solvent by soft baking it. Soft baking is nothing but heating or, or you know, you can use a bake oven or you can just use a simple hot plate and bake it for a while and then you do the exposure. Now you have the pattern on, on your wafer but you can still not see it. You will see it only when you develop. Development or developing is when you dissolve the unwanted parts and you still have the, the, the pattern, the desired pattern still there on, on your wafer. So that's the sixth step after that after now you already have the structure on your wafer you have what you wanted now what, what do you do after that hard bake edge resist strip and then inspections are basically done if you want to go one step further like you have a polymer pattern on your wafer but maybe that's not your final destination you don't really want that what you want is you want so you created some sort of windows in your wafer 
using a polymer. And now you want to do something to that silicon or the silicon dioxide that was exposed through those windows. You really want to uh, you know, etch that away. You want to create patterns over there. And you do everything. And then finally, remove the resist itself. So that was just there for masking your vapor for a while. And now you remove it. So photolithography, however, is, is for patterning that resist for the photoresist. Okay, so we come to the first part of it, or the first step of it, that surface preparation. When you do something on silicon vapor and you use an organic polymer, polymers always have, or mostly have, organic solvents in them. What you want is the surface to be as hydrophobic as possible, because that leads to a better adhesion. If there's any water on it or, or moisture on it, then the adhesion will not be good. So you want to make it as hydrophobic as possible. So first of all, you bake it. You just keep it um, you know, um, in, in the oven at 200 degree or something like so. All, if there's any moisture that evaporates. Uh, after that, what you do is there is a chemical called HMDS. Hmm? That makes your silicon wafer hydrophobic. You use that HMDS treatment, which is called vapor priming. Uh, you do that to improve the adhesion by making the silicon wafer more hydrophobic and how we do it is, is like this. So this is the reaction, this is what HMDS does, does to your silicon wafer. One thing that's important to note is silicon wafer pretty much always has some native oxide layer because it's never, it, it could be 10 angstroms but it's always there. So uh, silicon wafer always has some native oxide. And oxide is hydrophilic. So you need to get rid of the oxide. So um, in most cases, if, we, if you want a bare silicon wafer, we'll usually do some etch for oxide and get rid of it right before uh, the fabrication, right before the photolithography. And we also do um, uh, HMDS priming uh, to, to convert these SiOH uh, groups to th so the H is replaced by SiOH3, uh, CH3 tri, so trimethyl something. So this is what we do with HMDS, which makes the surface non-polar and therefore more hydrophobic. And we can measure this by measuring the contact angle. That's like a very simple way of knowing how hydrophobic your surface is. Just, just check the contact angle. OK. Now comes the photoresist application part. And you will be doing this in your, uh, in your practicum. And uh, this picture is actually from uh, of a spin coater that we have here in Bion. Uh, this is a silicon wafer placed on a vacuum chuck. So over here, this uh, small black thing will actually, the, the wafer sticks to it because of the vacuum. And then you can rotate it. What you do is just simply pour some dispense, some photoresist on, on it. And then on a specific RPM speed, you can rotate it. And this is a very nice reproducible and simple technique of making a layer of the desired thickness onto your vapor. You know, you can, uh, all you need to do is go to 3000 RPM for, for a certain viscosity of the polymer. Just go to the RPM that's, and usually it's, it's there in, uh, you know, it's specified by the manufacturer that, okay, if you're using SU8 and you have this viscosity of SU8 and you go to 3000 RPMs, then you make a 30 micron high thick layer. You know, and whatever extra, you don't need to worry about how much photoresist you pour on top of it. It doesn't have to be exact 5 ml or 2 ml or, you know, 3 ml. Because whatever access um, uh, so, uh, photoresist is there will actually just uh, be, uh, you know, kind of be thrown. It's, it's, it'll actually, uh, we, we'll close this um, spin coater and you will only get 30 micron layer no matter how much solvent, how much photoresist you apply onto it. And you'll see, and that, that's why every time you, you do this process, your uh, spin coater will get really dirty because you'll have all the access as you everywhere on your spin coater and you need to clean it. Um, so anyway, that's a very simple technique, reproducible. And uh, uh, these are the quality measures time, speed, thickness, uniformity, uh, in all the slides at each step, you will see that 
pretty much these four things are your quality measures because you need to always check pretty much after every step. Do you have the thickness that you wanted? Is it uniform? Was there a particle? If there's one bubble or one particle, that can spoil your structures. So that's why clean rooms are like so uh, you know, expensive to maintain because they, and, and you, when you go there, you need to uh, you, you gown up and you need to make sure that you, you tie your hair and, and so on because uh, otherwise, even if there's one small dust particle, the entire thing is gone. So of course, every time you check for particles and defects on your structures, and so this is how you can do the, so this one, this picture is like a bit more sophisticated where some, there's a, there's a dispenser for dispensing the photo. You can, what we use, we simply use droppers and we can, you know, dispense approximately five milliliter of, of the photo resist. And then, um, then we spin that thing. Now there's this formula which decides what should be the rotation, what should be the speed for the photoresist that you're using. In this formula, everything except the RPM, which is omega here, and the viscosity, pretty much everything else is constant. It's a constant that depends on the nature of your material. So you don't really need to worry about that. Like I said, the vendor, the manufacturer will always specify that for this particular viscosity, you need to use this RPM, but you should know how, how we get that. So this is the formula and this is how you find out what should be the RPM. Okay, now you have that layer of SU8 or, or any, any photoresist by the way uh, on, onto your structures. Now what you do is you bake it. You just keep it onto a hot plate at some specified temperature and you get rid of the solvent which is there. Because, you know, what's the next step? Next step is you're, you're going to expose the entire thing to the UV light. You're going to attach your wafer to a mask. If your polymer is not dried completely or it has any salt, it will damage your mask. And those masks are like really expensive. Those masks are, uh, you know, if you, if you have a very small feature size, very expensive masks and you don't want to damage your mask because that's something you use all the time. So uh, the most important uh, reason for doing a soft bake is to get rid of the solvent. Um, and then, of course, it also improves adhesion and it also increases or improves the uniformity of, of your layer. Okay, this is the important step. This is where we are actually patterning our vapor. So we have something like this, which is a mask. There's a UV light source. And there's this vapor, uh, vapor with a uh, coating of polymer that we already prepared. Hmm. Now, what happens when you expose it to the UV light? Uh, there are some photosensitive components or photo initiators that get activated when you expose the uh, entire thing to the UV light. And like we talked about negative and positive tone resists, we need to make sure that we do not underexpose or overexpose we need to make sure that whatever is the dose of UV light dose is, uh, is we, can, we can simply calculate it depending on the intensity of, of our lamp. Whatever is the energy required for that process or for that thickness, we, need, we should not go beyond that. So, and we also, if we do it, if we don't give enough energy, then maybe you'll lose your structures. Maybe you'll not get the shape that you want because the bottom of your structure, the bottom layer, did not really get enough UV light. And if you overexpose it, then the top layer got too much UV light and that's called T-topping. So we need to make sure that these parameters are taken care of. And another important thing is the alignment. When you're making something, you need to make sure that one, it is aligned. The first layer of your structures is aligned with the silicon wafer. Now silicon wafers, I don't know, uh, many of you who are undergrads may not have actually worked in the clean room, have you? Okay, so there are many people who have not worked. I mean, I'm sorry for, for the grad students because they already know it. Uh, but silicon wafer is uh, basically, it's a single crystal that I'm sure uh, Dr. Madhu must have taught in some of the classes before, or maybe he will be teaching. The entire silicon wafer is a single crystal and it has different orientations 
you can specify that you can buy 100 plane uh, wafer or 111 plane wafer or something like and this, the wafer breaks in a straight line always in the direction which is specified when you buy it okay so you need to make sure that your mask is the, the designs are aligned in such a way that after patterning the wafer if you break it it breaks between your designs you know you always give some space there and you want your wafer to break in those straight lines and in fact when we do the practice I'll make sure that I'll give you some used wafers or something and just practice how to break, break the wafer which is like it's a, it's a fun thing to do so uh, yeah but I'm not giving you new wafers for fun <laughs> I'll just give you the used ones um, so anyway um, so that's the first layer the mask needs to be aligned with the wafer and what's the second layer well you can actually make multi-layer structures with your photoresist what you do is you make one layer of your pattern and you you develop it everything is done and after that well you can make another layer using the same entire same process so it looks something like this and people people make you know multi-layer structures using these kind of things so in that case you need to align the second layer onto your first layer and because these structures are micro or nano you cannot really see those structures it's, you cannot just go and you know say that huh this is how this is aligned no because the gaps are mic you know in, in micron sizes so you need to do it under a microscope and this machine is called MA56 we have that in Bion uh, this machine actually this guy is looking into the microscope and here somewhere there's a mask and the wafer they are in, in contact with each other and what you need to do is you need to align so you, you'll make some alignment marks on your mask and you'll, you'll have one mark overlap with the other mark and that's how it's, it, it may take hours to actually align your first layer with the second layer and in some cases you also do double sided alignment for MIMS fabrication sometimes so alignment now when you do the alignment over here I said there is a, there's a mask and there is a wafer in most cases you'll have the mask touching your wafer and then you can you can uh, expose the UV light through it hmm? but suppose you have a material that can damage your mask no matter what no, no matter how much you soft bake it. it it's you know maybe a temperature sensitive thing or something and then it may damage your wafer what do you do in those cases you have to keep your mask a little bit away from your wafer and in that case you will get some diffraction from here and you will not really get the exact same structures that you wanted mm -hmm. there is a third technique a third technique where what you do is you between your mask and the vapor you have another lens and you actually project the image of what you did here so this is a focal uh, plane and you have another lens on the focal plane and then you are actually projecting the image that was there on the mask onto your wafer hmm? now here the optics become a little more complicated in these two cases it's fine see here this is your mask b is your feature size the window that you want and ideally it should look like this but uh, this is the intensity but however you will get more intensity in in the middle and may get some diffraction at the edges depends on s what is s is the gap between the t between your mask and the wafer so in case of contact because s is very small it's not zero by the way it's never like even in contact printing or uh, contact lithography this is never zero like at atomic level or some level it's not really completely in contact so there will be some value of s and in case of, of as you know if, as you go far from your vapor s increases and then that's how you you know then you get, get don't get as good structures as, as you would in contact now in the third case however you need to also take care of the optics with the second lens now here we are talking about the lens between the mask and the vapor which is on the image plane okay now what is 
the, there are four important concepts, four important things that you need to know, and your features will actually depend on these four things. One is the numerical aperture of the lens. Second one, which we'll uh, come to, is the depth of focus, then resolution, resolution of your structures, and the last one is the wavelength of your light. So all these factors will actually decide because photo, you cannot really get everything using photolithography. There's a limit to everything. There's a, there's a trade-off between um, you know, the exposure, uh, the, the kind of uh, numerical aperture you use for the lens and the depth of focus and the kind of uh, features you can make. You can probably not make very high features using a certain type of lens. So there's a trade-off. So we need to first understand what are these different um, concepts. What is a numerical aperture? Now people who do photography, they, you, you must have heard people say that, okay, we, we increase the aperture, decrease the aperture. Um, so what is this aperture? Uh, see this picture, this theta, which is uh, actually half, one half of the angular aperture, is called the numerical aperture of a lens. And how it is defined? N A is equal to N sine of this angle theta. Hmm? What is N here is the refractive index. So that's one for air because we mostly do everything in air. So that's, we, we kind of assume that it's one. And then sine theta is what your numerical aperture is. And so what's the maximum value of aperture for a lens? Is one, right? It's sine theta. That's maximum sine theta is one. So as long as it's, it's done in air, the maximum value of aperture is about it is one and actually practically people have gone to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 but nobody has actually achieved one hmm? because anyway what is good about having a bigger numerical aperture is the bigger your lens is the more lights you will be capturing the more diffracted lights you'll be capturing so finer objects uh, can be uh, can actually be seen you will have a better resolution the, the more light more diffracted light you capture hmm? Um, and this, of course, becomes a much bigger issue when you're doing something in 3D rather than 2D because you don't much care about, you know, different heights of the structures in, in, in 2D or IC-related uh, uh, designs. So, and what is important to understand is finer details or the more closely packed designs, the higher resolution designs, they give much higher angles of diffraction, so much higher theta, so you need a bigger and bigger lens to capture more and more light. But how big can you make it? I mean, you cannot really make a very big, uh, how big can you make it? And also how big is, uh, you should make it because as you increase the numerical aperture, you decrease the depth of focus, hmm? which I'll tell you in the next slide. You see these two pictures? If your lens is bigger, then it forms a cone, see the optics. You form this kind of cone and then this thing here is the depth of focus. So the bigger numerical aperture, the smaller the depth of focus. And in this case, if the lens is small, then the depth of focus is large. Hmm? Why do you care about depth of focus? So if you do photography, for example, what, what does it mean to have a bigger focal lens? If I want to take a picture of someone sitting in the front row and someone sitting in the last row, I want both these guys to be in my focal lens because I want both their faces to, you know, to, to I want to be able to recognize both. So, uh, however, if I want to take a picture of someone sitting right in the center or if I want to just take a, a close-up picture of, of a pen or something like that, then I don't really care. Then even if my focal length is this much, it's fine. So when we do multi-layer photography or uh, photolithography, similarly, it's the same concept. If we have two different structures, two different, uh, you know, step-like structures or something, I want all those points to be in my focal length. So what I want is I want a larger depth of focus. And therefore, it's only a certain numerical aperture that I can have. I cannot really go beyond that. So there's a trade-off between the two. And one thing that I missed on the previous slide is this, immersion lithography. By the way, we always assume that everything is done in air, which is done in air because it's in the clean room or wherever, and is always one, but it's not always one because people actually thought that, okay, we cannot really have to, uh, you know, sine theta can only be one, 
the maximum value. So what do we do? We can change n. What we can change is the refractive index of the medium. So people are actually use, using, like dipping the entire setup underwater and then performing the photolithography because water has a refractive index of 1.5, so you can increase the Na that way, you know. However, that's not like, of course, that's very expensive and complicated, but people will do anything to get smaller feature sizes. So, okay, and we know what is depth of focus. And uh, whatever I just said about photography, you can also see it in, uh, you know, see it with this example. So if you want to take a picture where you want these mountains and these stones, all of these things to be in focus. Point A and point B, what do you want? You want a larger depth of focus, then you want a smaller aperture. And in this case, you take a close-up picture, you don't much care about the background. In that case, you want to get all the details of the flower, you, get, you want to get all the diffracted lights. So you want to use a lens with a wider aperture. Okay. The fourth thing is resolution. This, you don't, don't need to worry about the derivation of this formula. You need to, to go and solve Maxwell equations for, for getting here, but, so that's beyond the course. Uh, but you just need to kind of know this formula and know how resolution and sine theta, the numerical aperture and depth of focus, how these things are related to each other. And if you increase one, the other goes down. So you need to uh, kind of just, just get a hang of this. You should know how they are related. You don't need to memorize it or something. Okay, and the last thing that affects your uh, resolution or, or the feature sizes is the wavelength. You can only, um, you know, the smaller the wavelength gets, the finer features you can get. Hmm? Now, also, the smaller the wavelength gets, the more expensive and difficult it becomes to, uh, to have that laser. We perform most of the photolithography work still at 365. However, if we, if we go to 248, we can have smaller feature sizes. So um, in this, uh, uh, on the slide, however, do note that I'm also changing the numerical aperture values. So uh, if you keep that constant, then you'll be able to see how these things are related, but just remember that smaller lambda, smaller features. Okay, so we are done with the optics part. We are done with the exposure part here. Now, what's the next step? That is the post exposure bake. Now, some processes may not have a post exposure. That depends on the chemical that you use. I added this step because in your practicum, you'll be doing photolithography using SU8, and in case of SU8, it is a very important step. Post-exposure bake is actually when most of the cross-linking happens. When you expose the polymer to the UV light, it only initiates uh, the photogenerators, but the cross-linking actually takes place during the post-exposure bake when you do the heat treatment, and it also improves the adhesion, so this is a very important step for SU8 photolithography, and for some polymers it may not be important, or it may not be there at all. Okay, now you cross-linked the polymer or degraded the polymer wherever you wanted. You've done, you've done with the patterning, whether it was a positive resist or negative resist. Now what do you do? Now you need to get rid of the material that's unwanted, that's uh, you know, on those places where you don't want your pattern. So you call it develop, you use a specific developer for some uh, positive photoresist, it can actually be as simple as acetone or even water, but in case of negative photoresist, it's, it's usually more complicated, and you need to buy the developer for your, uh, for your um, polymer, for your photoresist. So you dispense some developer onto your wafer now, and now you will see the patterns. Till now, you actually did not see the patterns, okay? You, you, did expose the wafer to the UV light, but you don't really know if what you made is still there or you know, if it's there in good shape. Now you'll be able to see the structures onto your wafer. Now, um, I don't know how many of you have uh, seen or used um, a camera which used rolls or a film, right? 
Okay, so the old-fashioned camera before the digital photography uh, used to have a film. That is actually the same concept. In fact, all these photolithography uh, things are inspired by photography, that kind of photography. The film, what, what was called a film, was actually a film of photoresist on a plastic roll. So that film was, uh, and the moment you open the shutter of your camera, different wavelengths of lights will, will affect or will modify the chemical nature of that photoresist on, on uh, film. And then you developed that thing then you actually dipped it into a, into a chemical and then you could see the picture. So it's the entire, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, however, now we are making different patterns, we're using masks and so on. By the way, do you know that on whatever you got on that film was called a negative of the picture, right? Uh, why was it called negative? There's nothing negative about it. <laughs> okay, that was made on a negative photoresist. So that's why it was called negative. So anyway, uh, that's where all this comes from. And again, uh, as quality measure, you will check for the line resolution, uniformity, and, and, and if you have any particles defects there. OK, now you have the patterns. You see those patterns uh, on, onto your baker. And now you do a hard bake. Hard bake is something where you actually just keep this entire thing in the oven in case there's any leftovers of the solvent, of the byproducts that are formed during the photolithography process, anything that need to go away. Secondly, the adhesion improves a lot when you do hard bake. And uh, you always use a higher temperature than soft bake. Because why? Because like I said, now after cross-linking, the um, TG or glass transition temperature has changed. Now it has gone slightly now it is slightly higher than what it was in the beginning. So now you can actually use higher temperatures and uh, it'll still not melt. Okay, and you do the inspection. Now that's a simple thing. You just go in and check it under the microscope. And if you, if you have like very fine features, then you may need to do uh, SEM meteorology or so on. Okay, so we are done actually with the fabrication of patterns of polymer patterns or photoresist pattern onto the wafer. But now if you want to go further, you want to, uh, you know, you just use that photoresist as, uh, as patterning a wafer and you, what you need to, act, what you actually want to do is remove the silicon or silicon dioxide, whatever it was, from these windows, from, from here. And you just want the, the photoresist pattern to be there and you just want to selectively etch away your silicon. What will you do? You will use, uh, I, did uh, Dr. Madhu already teach about uh, um, plasma and uh, sputtering and so on? He did, right? Okay, so you need to make sure that if you are using plasma edge or dry edge, the um, dry edge should not be physical, it should be chemically assisted. You know, why? Because I don't want to remove the photoresist. I want the photoresist, it, it has to be very specific to silicon. Or if you are sil using silicon dioxide, then you need to have something that etches only silicon dioxide and does not etch photoresist. Hmm? So uh, for silicon, you will use uh, CF4 plasma. And uh, then what you will do is you will remove your silicon. If, and that will be a subtractive technique. And if you want to add something instead of removing it, whatever you want to do, you can add something by sputtering. You can also deposit. deposit metals, you can do whatever you want to do with this wafer. And then finally get rid of, okay, this is, then finally get rid of the photoresist. Before that, this is another slide where we talk about uh, how the entire process is done. So this is like whatever, uh, this is kind of summary of whatever we talked till now. Uh, so we, we first coat the uh, uh, photoresist and then we expose it to the UV light, then we develop it, so we create a window. And from this window, now here, this gray portion is actually silicon dioxide. Huh? So from this window, now you remove the silicon dioxide and then you also get rid of the photoresist. So why did we do the entire thing? Because we wanted to make a window in our silicon dioxide, which is a very important process in, in uh, semiconductor industry because you need to uh, you know, make selective uh, openings of insulating uh, materials and uh, that's how you place your electronics there. So for these kind of processes, you, this is kind of a summary of whatever we did. And uh, the photoresist strip can be done using uh, oxygen plasma. Again, 
you need to either use a very specific plasma or you need to use edge stops. So that is something which depends on what you're fabricating. And then finally, the final inspections after you're done with all this, you again need to do SEM one more time and check what you did and then check for the critical dimensions, then check for defects and particles. And if you come to know now that your first step went wrong, well, you can't really do much about it. You need to just redo the whole thing because that's, that's how photolithography or micro nanolithography is different from traditional manufacturing because you can't really see anything. You know, you just need to be confident that what you did was fine and you need to make sure that each step, if, if you need to do 10 minutes of post-exposure bake, just do it for 10 minutes. Don't do it for, you know, seven minutes. Don't do it. Don't overdo it. Just need to be very perfect at each step. And that's when you can, it's because you can only see it afterwards, then you, you don't really know what you've done. So we'll do all this in the first practicum. That's all for today. And uh, next time I'll complete the photolithography class. There are a few more things that we'll talk about, for example, mass fabrication and, and a couple of more things. And then we'll talk about soft lithography briefly and talk about the practicums that we need to do. Thank you. So I'll see you on Thursday. Oh, thank you.